Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon and I'm the Dean of Graduate Studies at Charles Darwin University and welcome to Outrider 16. What makes a PhD a PhD? This Outrider has a couple of pretty disturbing triggers. Both of them involved information that students gave to me. The first student said to me that a PhD is simply about spending time in the lab. She didn't actually realise that a thesis was required at the end of it. She thought it was just time in a lab. That's a PhD. And the second rather unusual case study that triggered this outrider is that a student said that a PhD is simply stapling in a couple of refereed articles with an introduction and an outro, a conclusion. So what we're learning here is we've got students enrolled in a PhD that don't actually know what a PhD is. So these stories worried me a lot. The time has come to be honest and the time has come to be clear. What makes a PhD a PhD? Let's do this. It is clear that assumptions about a PhD are the pathway to failure. A PhD is very different from refereed publications. Peer review is very different from examination. They're different processes. It's so common, very, very common, that examiners read a chapter that was a refereed article and find errors within it, and a student reverts to revise and resubmit. They thought they were okay because they had a peer-reviewed article and errors were found in the peer review article through examination. So let's wipe away these assumptions, shall we? Let's get real about you and about your PhD. Let's do this. And why this is important, I think, is failure in all areas of teaching and learning, whether we're dealing with first year students or PhD students, failure emerges from the assumptions that teachers have. So to translate this into the doctoral space, your supervisors have assumptions. And if they don't share those assumptions with you, that's a dangerous terrain. Similarly, you have assumptions. And unless you can express those to your supervisor, again, we're in a troubled terrain. But you see, your assumptions are even more damaging than your supervisor's assumptions because we don't know what we don't know. And even more sadly, it's very difficult to express to others what we do not know. And that's why I think students are in a doctoral program and they're either asking, what is a PhD? Or they're in a PhD and they clearly have no idea what are the requirements of it. So let's do it. PhDs are an international qualification and they are examined by international experts in that field. There are diverse modes of doctorate, but all PhDs have one characteristic. They have an original contribution to knowledge. We're going to talk about that in a second. And this SOC now, significant original contribution to knowledge, is evaluated by your examiners. So examination is everything, everything in a PhD. It is the moment of quality assurance in your doctorate. So all the other things that may occur during your candidature, that's great, but the most important part of your enrolment is the examination. A PhD is nationally distinctive. There are two general models. The first is the model that exists in the United Kingdom, Aotearoa, New Zealand and Australia. And then we have the Canadian and the United States model. And obviously most of the universities around the world are not in those nations, but they do take components of those two models and render it significant and appropriate for their nation state. The PhD in Australia, Aotearoa, New Zealand and the United Kingdom is a three year program and it does not include coursework. It's composed of a dissertation that spans between 80,000 words 
and 100,000 words. And it's based on the research conducted during that three years, during that period of time. That's incredibly important to give you another assumption. I had a student in my office explaining how research she did before she was enrolled in a PhD was going to be part of her PhD. Again, you see the assumptions, right? So the research is conducted during the period of your candidature and then it is examined. The PhD is based on original research. A research master's degree, an important, wonderful, extraordinary qualification in and of itself, but a master's degree synthesizes already existing knowledge. A PhD is an original contribution to knowledge. In the US, and the Canadian models, PhD students complete coursework and a series of mandatory examinations before they enter their thesis writing component. During a PhD, a student may publish, a student may go to conferences, and that's great if they do, but you can pass, pass effectively, pass well, a PhD without having ever gone to a conference or without ever having published an article or any, any output of any kind. The quality of a thesis is confirmed by its examiners. This examination protocol differs quite radically by nation state. Australia is one of the few nations in the world that still does not have an oral examination but about a third of the Australian universities now have an oral exam. But having said that, and as someone who's participated in those oral examinations in the last three, four years in Australia, the examinations as they currently are configured in Australia are poor. They're not really within a mature examination system or process. And what's happening in many universities in Australia at the moment, and I apologise to international uh, colleagues for this one, but universities are asking examiners to write down the questions that the students will answer during the oral exam. And that's given to the student and they prepare the answers to those questions. Uh, that's not the point of an oral examination. So that's actually defeating the purpose. The other characteristic though of a PhD is that it is guided research. It is constructed by the student with the assistance of experts, advisors, supervisors. Regular meetings are held and feedback is provided on that research. There are lots of different modes of doctorate, very exciting space really. There's obviously the traditional doctorate that I've just talked about, 80 to 100,000 words. There's the practice-led, creative-led thesis that I describe as the artefact exegesis thesis. It used to exist in fine arts and creative arts, but now it's moving throughout all knowledge systems. So artefact and exegesis, and the exegesis is about 50,000 words in that particular mode. We have the PhD by prior publication, the PhD by publication, the prof doc, the professional doctorate, hi to all the prof dockers out there, you rock, and the higher doctorate. That's the suite of doctorates. All of them are different. And we try, except in every case, except the higher doctorate, we attempt to create a parity of quality between the modes. We fail a lot when we're doing that, but we try to ensure that what exists in terms of quality of research in one mode is able to be shared with the other modes. Applied research, particularly in health and education, moves into the prof doc and conventional or blue sky research tends to go into the traditional doctorate. At its best, during a candidature, students experience all sorts of things. They experience teaching undergraduate students, perhaps even teaching and assisting honours and master's students, and that adds value to the CV. They have a professional development program that, again, value adds to their skills and their career, and they tend to go to conferences and they tend to produce publications. There's also, at its best, some sort of public communication and engagement with that research. The PhD is precious. 
The PhD is a unique experience. Just over 2% of the US population have a PhD and around the world, just over 1% of the world's population have a PhD. So this is so special. This is spectacular and you're enrolled in one of these. How amazing is that? It's rare and it's very, very important. It is distinctive too as an experience because you often give up a steady job or you certainly give up the opportunity to earn big bucks for a period of time. Your family suffers, your friends suffer, you suffer. So why are you doing all of this? The point of a PhD is that you're attempting to learn something new. You're attempting to challenge yourself and you're wanting to contribute to knowledge. If you're lacking one of those three attributes, then that's often when we get into trouble with people being undermotivated or just not able to finish. They haven't got the push to finish because this is gonna get tough and you've gotta have the motivation to get you through those tough times. So it's a very, very distinctive experience. But it is the qualification of the university. It's the qualification of your career and it is to quote that old cliche, your PhD. It is your PhD. So don't be a guest star in your own PhD. Focus on a consistency of work and an original contribution to knowledge. And please remember that this is precious. 99% of the world's population have not and perhaps cannot do this. So let's therefore finish off by giving you the information that may write your introduction and your conclusion and certainly will assist your abstract. Because what makes a PhD a PhD these days is a SOC, a significant original contribution to knowledge. And if your examiner cannot find your SOC, <laughs> uh, then you're going to have a very, very problematic pathway through examination, full stop. So let me make it easier for you. Let me show you how to demonstrate a SOC to examiners. The definition of a PhD is that it makes an original contribution to knowledge. And that's why in some systems, if an examiner can't find an original contribution to knowledge, a master's degree is granted to you. A doctorate offers a distinctive pathway through knowledge. So originality is crucial to a PhD. It is the defining characteristic of a PhD. But the SOC is beautiful in how it crystallises in and through the doctoral project. Significant, original, contribution to knowledge. But I'm going to look at each of those letters, but I'm going to do them backwards. So I'm going to start with the K word. Yes, I'm going to start with the least controversial word, and that is knowledge. Now, we all have a pretty good sense of what knowledge is. Knowledge is the theoretical and practical understanding of a subject. That information can be obtained formally or informally. So that's when we talk about formal or informal knowledge. And the term knowledge applies an understanding of something. Understanding of something, subjects, disciplines, skill sets. More specifically, of course, in philosophy, the study of knowledge is called epistemology. Knowledge is not simply true, following on from Plato. Knowledge is, quote, justified true belief. That's Plato. Justified true belief. Magnificent three words there. So for Plato, justified true belief. Just because we believe it <laughs> doesn't make it knowledge because it's got to be justified. And you see, that's what makes knowledge, knowledge. While I think that's a pretty bland description, I think it's probably the best one. Knowledge is not a vibe. Knowledge is not a feeling. Knowledge is not an assumption. Knowledge has an audience. It is believed. That means an individual can't invent knowledge. So I can go, oh, look, this is my knowledge. No, knowledge must be communicated, verified, assessed, and shared. Knowledge 
has an audience. For a PhD, the key audience for your research is the examiner. Therefore, knowledge must be disseminated, knowledge must be assessed, it must be evaluated, and yes, knowledge must be believed. Knowledge is really the whole point of living a scholarly life. What makes philosophy philosophy is the theory of knowledge that undergirds it. Now, our next word is the C word. Yes, obviously, contribution. How does, I love this bit, how does a PhD make a contribution to knowledge? What does that look like? Contribution is the role or the part played by a person or an object that enables the understanding of something. That is something that advances knowledge. That's a contribution. Contribution is also linked, though, with importance. This is where it gets a bit weird. How you, as a scholar, how you have intervened in your field. This could be, for example, for many disciplines, health, education, the policy implications. So how practices in your field may have changed. In allied health, if you're a physiotherapist, how is your research transforming the practices in your field? A contribution can recontextualise theory, recontextualise a method or a technique. It can expand an existing model and it can also, at its best, combine two things to create something new. Impact is big. It's a really, really big word at the moment. It's pretty ambiguous too, which worries me a bit. But start to think about the impact of your research and that may start to allow you to articulate the contribution that you are making. Okay, let's get to the O word. Here it is, originality. A PhD must present, it must demonstrate and it must confirm an original contribution to knowledge. This is where so many students go wrong, if I'm honest with you, because it's assumed that there's an original contribution to knowledge and the examiners can't find it. So I ensure all of my students, and I've got some wonderful students starting this week, so I'm very, very excited. And one of the key things we're going to talk about in their first meeting this week is the writing of a sentence in their thesis, in the abstract and the introduction and the conclusion where they present this sentence. My original contribution to knowledge is... My original contribution to knowledge is we need to get that in a sentence and put it throughout the thesis like pepper over a meal. The best doctoral research is able to present originality in a succinct, clear and really precise way. Originality in the doctorate, if it's presented in sort of a generalised or assumed way, that's when we start to hit problems with examiners. The moment examiner sort of has to look for your originality, we're in trouble. You must be able to pinpoint with clarity what your original contribution to knowledge is. Originality is confirmed through a series of variables. There is sort of a checklist on this one. Firstly, have you got a strong and expansive knowledge of the literature? And that can be verified through a literature review, systematic review, scoping review, etc. And then research methods are transparently presented. So through methods, you are demonstrating what is known and how you are creating something new. Fantastic. And that, therefore, is the scaffold that moves you from your current knowledge system to your originality. That's the way you do it. The literature review and a clear presentation of research methods confirms your accountability, your transparency and your rigour. It demonstrates the repeatability of your research. Your examiner can follow you in your pathway through knowledge. The important part of this originality discussion, I think, is it's not simply a matter of outlining your originality, this is the error that students make. You have to demonstrate 
originality. You need to take your examiner by the hand and walk with them to your originality claim. You need to show that it is meaningful research. That word may help some colleagues. So originality is why is this research meaningful? Originality, therefore, is something that's novel, something that is unique, and it manifests in the doctorate in many ways. You may be presenting new information for the first time. So for a lot of our colleagues working in archives, something new has appeared and that's your innovation. So it's source material, great. It could be carrying out original research. So you've got your methods, there's a whole series of knowledge systems around you, but you are conducting that research in a really innovative way. And you may be also generating an innovative new technique, a way of thinking. You could also have an original method or an original interpretation. Originality can also be you are doing something unusual. You are testing somebody else's idea in a new way. That works incredibly well. It may be simply empirical work that has never been done before. Applying an old technique to a new era. Love that, love that a lot. Big hi to Paul. Paul and I do that a lot. A very old idea that in many ways has been parked that we bring forward and place in a new context. And you may also be applying new evidence to an old issue. So something new has been released and that's transforming the interpretation of something in the past. As you can see, the key challenge here and why I'm stressing this is because this is why students start to hit a revise and resubmit or worse in their thesis, is that you must not simply claim originality, you must prove it. And there are lots of ways you can do it, lots of ways you can do it, but by focusing on evidence, by focusing on literature, by focusing on methods, that is your pathway. Also remember, please present it with clarity. Use my sentence, the original contribution to knowledge is. I also love David Lodge's statement about originality that I use a lot, deviating from the conventional, habituated ways of representing reality. End of quote. Brilliant. Now, we're at the final letter. We're at the most difficult one, the most challenging one. We're at S, significance. While there are some relatively objective configurations I can give you about objectivity and about contribution and about knowledge. Significance is in the eye of the beholder. Students worry quite rightly that examiners may be arbitrary in their judgments. They may be picking out what the student sees as bizarre errors or flaws. And you've often heard me describe PhD examination as a dark art, and it is. We need to remember that the power held by PhD examiners is enormous. They hold all the power. Three years of your life, they hold in their hands. So the value of your research is determined by two or three people at the end of the process. Now, yes, we as deans, we configure policies and procedures and checklists for examiners. And the reason we do that is to shape the normative parameters of examination. But can I say the only reason I'm really in this business is because I believe in the autonomy of examiners. I respect the excellence of the knowledge held by examiners and therefore I respect their views, respect their interpretation and respect their judgment. The whole PhD program falls down if you do not come to this situation with profound respect for your examiners. What examiners are looking for? We're looking for the presentation of the literature and then a demonstration of how your methods have taken that literature and moved it somewhere else. That's what we're looking for. But the word significant is a bit different and it is the word that worries me. Now, don't get me wrong, if your thesis has made a significant contribution to knowledge, that's brilliant, that's tremendous. But as I was moving through the literature to help you in this outrider, I think I found four clear ways that you can prove significance, that if you're able to use this language and present this through the thesis, that is significant. So let's do this. Four possible strategies to configure significance. The importance of your research question. 
Therefore, explain to the examiner why the research is worth doing. When students do that, they have beautiful paragraphs, lovely work. Secondly, obviously, the significance of the findings. So why should the examiners care? Why do your findings matter? Three, explain how your research transforms theory. And theory has, depending on your discipline, a capital T there or not. So transformations of theory often configure significance. And four, explain the generalizability or the lack of generalizability of your research. So here are your findings. Can they move about a bit? So that's significance. Can I also say, don't think if they're not generalizable data sets and interpretations, don't go, oh, it's not significant. Actually, the lack of movement and you calling that saying, this is the data set, it's a significant original contribution to knowledge because it won't travel well into other paradigms, disciplines, nature, nations or regions. Crucial. That's value. And just to add a little bit of final worry to the word significant, it can also capture the interest of stakeholders. That's one of those weird words that we're living through at the moment. But it can capture your social, your economic or your cultural significance. Significance, again, can be linked to impact. There are lots of topics that can be dismissed as unimportant because they're not contributing to the policy flavour of the day. Don't allow that to get you down, all right? So if, if you go, I haven't got any impact, you can be incredibly significant in your research and not have impact. Don't worry about that. Significance is not about size. Something very, very small can be significant. It is about importance. And my challenge is that importance is frequently subjective. All the other letters in the SOC, original contribution, knowledge, can be demonstrated, confirmed, verified. It has some objectivity to it. Significance, I think, is a lot more difficult to prove. It is much more in the gift and in the subjectivity of the examiner. Significance, like importance, is always framed from a particular perspective. And all of us, think about it, in our lives, can figure, right, oh, well, that's important, or that's significant. Well, that's subjective, that's emotional, that's about our personal experiences. And also the determination of significance can be political, and we live in highly political times. All examiners, like all researchers, we all have our biases, we have our sort of favoured topics and tropes and theories, and therefore the claims for significance can tend to move into that direction. But I still believe it is useful for us, as students, as supervisors, as researchers, to be aware of the changing language and landscape of the doctorate. And I hope what we've captured today is the PhD has a history. And that history changes but we are a crucial part of that history. I wish you love, light and peace. Tia.